friends, students, educators, lend me your ears. I come to bring you this new edition of History in a Nutshell. In this episode, we will be traveling back thousands of years to some of the earliest days of Western civilization. So, what comes to mind when you hear the words ancient Rome? Gladiators? Architecture? Emperors? Perhaps togas? Join me as we take a journey through ancient Rome, from Rome's founding and the Republic, to the reign of the emperors and its eventual collapse. What began as a small group of villages on the river Tiber, Rome would grow to become one of the world's largest and most influential superpowers, stretching all the way from Western Europe and Asia to the Middle East and North Africa. Now, there are two versions of how Rome began. There are the grandiose mythological tales, such as traditional Roman legend, or what is chronicled in Virgil's The Aeneid, and then there's the true story. According to Roman legend, Romulus and Remus were the sons of Mars, the god of war himself. Left to die as babies on the river Tiber by King Amulius of Alba Longa, the boys were raised by a she-wolf and eventually overthrew King Amulius. Instead of ruling Alba Longa for themselves, Romulus and Remus wanted to found a city of their own. Sadly, Romulus ended up killing his brother over a dispute regarding the hill on which to settle. Romulus eyed Palatine Hill, while Remus preferred Aventine Hill. Following Remus's death, Romulus is said to have become Rome's first king on April the 21st, 753 BC. In reality, Archaeological evidence suggests that Rome was a thriving town long before 753 BC. For about 200 years, Rome was ruled by kings, though these kings were more akin to tribe or village leaders than actual kings. These kings ruled with absolute power, known as imperium. They created laws, served as the chief religious leader, and head of the military. The kings were also responsible for expanding Rome's size, and did so by conquering neighboring territories. Wealth from the surrounding regions flowed in, which enabled Rome to become as large and as prosperous as it did. However, not much is known about Rome's first four kings, which were Latins. Romulus' successor, King Numa Pompilius, began some of Rome's earliest building projects, but Roman architecture wouldn't really take off until Etruscan rulers from the northern region of Etruria took power in Rome. The Etruscans are noted for transforming Rome from a village into an actual city. A sewer called the Cloaca Maxima was Rome's first major construction project and enabled the marshy region between Capitoline Hill and Palatine Hill to be drained and paved over with gravel. This area became known as the Roman Forum, a bustling city square which featured the king's residence, where trials and political events were held, and where citizens could shop and socialize. The Etruscans are attributed to giving the Romans writing, public buildings, and a new political, social, and military organization. However, while Roman culture would most certainly be influenced by the Etruscans, the Romans ultimately maintained their own way of life. It would not be long before the Romans would throw off the yoke of monarchy and establish itself as a republic. The last of the Etruscan kings, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, was extremely unpopular with the Roman people. He was not only a tyrannical ruler, but was responsible for deposing his predecessor, King Servius Tullius, along with senators who remained loyal to him. Now, it's important to note that even before Rome became a republic, there was already an established assembly and senate, which served the king in an advisory role. The Roman elite grew tired of not being taken seriously, and as a result, Roman aristocrats, led by Lucius Junius Brutus, incited a rebellion and forced Tarquinius Superbus into exile. With the overthrow of Tarquinius, the people now held the leading powers in Rome. Thus, beginning the days of the Republic. Republic comes from the Latin res public, which literally translates to property of the people. 
The transition from monarchy to republic would not be an easy one, however, for the overthrow of the king created major political unrest. Not only were the leading families involved in power squabbles, but there would also be unrest between the Roman elite, the patricians, and the lower class, the plebeians. After some years of conflict, the plebeians forced the Senate to create the Twelve Tables, a series of laws outlining rights for Roman citizens, and gave the plebeians their own representatives in the government, called tribunes. Even with the Twelve Tables, rights for citizens were still heavily one-sided in favor of the patricians. For example, at first, only patricians could become senators. The plebeians felt this was extremely unfair, and the period from 494 to about 297 BC became known as the Conflict of Orders. Eventually, the plebeians did gain equal legal footing with the patricians. Power in the government shifted from heritage and family ties to wealth and political influence. From its earliest days, the Senate grew from about 100 men to around 900 at the height of the empire. So how did the Republic work? The Roman Republic actually functioned similarly to how the U.S. Congress is structured. The Republic had three branches of government, which served different functions and included checks and balances. There was an executive branch, the consulship, the legislative assembly, held by the plebeians, and the senate. Other magistrate positions existed, such as praetors, censors, and aediles, but I'll get to those later. Since Rome didn't want kings anymore, they elected consuls, which served as the chief magistrates in Rome. Two consuls were elected at the same time, and terms only lasted for one year. They served jointly, thus making abuse of power extremely difficult. Consuls presided over the Senate and the assemblies when they were in session, served as heads of the military, and introduced laws which the Senate and assemblies would either pass or veto. The Senate and Legislative Assemblies served advisory roles during the Republic. They performed duties such as preparing legislation, managed finances and foreign relations, and supervised the state religion. While the Senate did not themselves make laws, they instead could issue decrees, which held the same weight. There were a couple of ways one could become a senator. The most common way was to be appointed by either a consul or censor. But if a person was elected to a magistrate position, he automatically became a senator. For a Roman citizen, becoming a senator was a highly sought-after goal, for the title senator meant a great deal of respect and political esteem. Other magistrate positions outside of the consulship in the Senate served crucial roles in the Roman Republic. It was the job of praetors to enforce Roman laws. Think of praetors as the ancient Roman version of a judicial branch, as Rome grew in size, more praetors were appointed throughout the empire to enforce laws and to keep the peace. Censors served a multitude of roles, such as counting Roman citizens, and oversaw major building projects such as roads and aqueducts. Censors dealt with numerous aspects of daily Roman life and regularly worked with other politicians. Lastly, aediles were in charge of maintaining Roman infrastructure and kept records of food, water, and festivities throughout the empire. <laughs>